Welcome to the Farm Beats podcast. Farm Bits is proudly produced by the Nebraska Digital Agricultural Team and hosted by students at the University of Nebraska. The Farm Bits podcast comes to you each week to discuss the trends, the realities, and the value of digital agriculture. Through interviews with experts, producer, produce, through interviews with experts, producers, and innovators from across the agricultural industry, we hope that you step away from each episode with new practical knowledge of digital agriculture technology. Hello, Farm Bits followers, and welcome to the 100th episode of the Farm Bits podcast. I'm Katie Bathy. And I'm Deepa Gimire, and we are glad to have you with us as we begin our discussion on the special topic of multi-generation farm story featuring the Kudera family. This family has been in operation since 1908, and today we will hear from the third and fourth generation of the farm. Okay, I'll start. I guess I'm the oldest, like 66 years old, was born on the farm. Uh, my wife, Cameron, joined the operation when we got married. And it's hard to say a date when I actually started. <laughs> I was interested in farming from day one and just stayed part of it. Awesome. I'm Tammy, and I joined when we got married in 1994. I'm 62 years old. Um, I've enjoyed being on the farm. I, I grew up in town, so it was a new experience for me, but I really enjoyed it. We enjoyed raising a family on the farm. I'm Corbin Kudra. I'm fourth generation on the farm. I'm 23 years old. Uh, graduated from UNL with an agronomy degree a year ago. And now I work for CVA Co-op along with farming as well. Uh, I guess kind of like dad says, it's not really a set time to start farming. You just kind of start helping out as a kid and just kind of stick with it. But I guess I guess I'm in my third season of actually having a crop of my own. Awesome. All right, and I'm Kara Cutter. I'm Corbin's sister. I'm also the fourth generation. Um, I'm 22 years old. I just graduated with a nursing degree, so I went a little bit different route with um, education, but I still find myself involved a lot on the family farm. Um, I started farming probably the earliest thing I remember doing is just feeding chickens and picking eggs when I was probably old enough to walk. So, and I've been just helping out ever since. I love that. I love that you mentioned the start, just kind of, you just, you naturally move into it. There's no, it's not like a job. You don't pick a day and you start, you just kind of do. And I think that's really representative of a lot of family farms. So I think I love that. Just bucket calves that they had as soon as they were old enough to do them. Yeah. Yeah. For a yeah. while, I thought Carol was going to be a veterinarian, not a nurse. Yeah. And she does do all of the cattle vaccination. If there's anything with the syringe, she's the one doing it. Awesome. Okay, yeah, that's that's great. And we are excited to hear more about you and your farm. So uh, moving forward, can you please share when did your family's farming operation begin and where are you located at? Uh, my grandfather purchased the farm in 1908 from his brother who had purchased it just a little bit earlier, is essentially in the middle of Colfax County in the area of Wilson Church and the Langley School District 34. Was unique about Langley as it was a two room schoolhouse and it didn't go to just eighth grade, it went to 10th grade. We're not right by any of the towns in the county just over 20 miles northeast of Columbus. Another part of the farm is one mile south of Clarkson. That farm was homesteaded by my aunt's grandfather in 1884. Awesome. And then you kind of mentioned this a little bit, but um, we're, our next question is what led you into farming? And it sounds like it's very, very family based. So if you want to just talk about that a little bit. Yes, growing up on the farm, I was just part of it from day one. I also went to uh, UNL and graduated with an agronomy degree. But uh, when I was graduating, we're coming right into the farm crisis, so to speak. 
So I took a little safer route and uh, took a job in ag lending along with the farming and stayed with it a little longer than I had planned. That's kind of the same story as dad. So always grew up on the farm, so just always helped with it. And yeah, again, too, kind of took the safe route with having a job at CVA along with farming, but uh, farming's kind of always been my passion and probably always will be my passion. Uh, I guess as a little kid, I'd always, when dad would be planting, I'd steal a little bit of seed out of the planter and then any dirt patch in the yard, I'd go and plant that. So there'd be corn and beans growing all over the yard and I'm sure. Mom wasn't happy about that when she had to mow. But. I love that. I love the family start. I love the family passion. I think that's really awesome. Yeah, I, I really like like how you started very early and then have been growing up together with on this farm. So as we are talking about uh, the farm, so what kind of crops uh, has your farm produced over the years? Right now, we're primarily a corn soybean rotation, and we brought some alfalfa back in to speed up the process into no-till. In the past, we raised oats. We needed oats to feed the workhorses, rye, grain, sorghum. And since we have a barley base, some barley must have been raised in the past. Okay. Also, yeah. that's neat. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, as currently we don't have nearly the, the diversity like Dad is talking about with all the crops we have grown, but a lot of that's just due to limited markets in the area. It's predominantly corn and soybeans to well, corn to feed the ethanol plant in Columbus predominantly, and then cattle feeders as well. Soybeans kind of for livestock feed predominantly, but the... Uh, Chicken barns came into the area. That was a big increase in demand for corn and soybeans and alfalfa tubes. Feed a lot of cattle around, but so there, there isn't a whole lot of market for any other crops around so much. But I guess one way we've kind of started to bring some of that diversity back in the rotation is um, planting cover crops. We've kind of last five years or so, we've got more into that with our sloping ground to kind of reduce erosion and stuff like that so by doing that it brings some of the diversity back we've been doing rye and peas and rapeseed and turnips and stuff like that so kind of in a way that's it we're growing those crops and just not taking them all the way to harvest okay yeah no i love that you mentioned that i think that's um I think that's a commonality that we see across the state of Nebraska is of what's the markets in, how can our farmers fit those, and then where, and then that's when the cover crop crop conversation really starts coming into play of how can we incorporate these, whether you take them full term or not. So I I love that you mentioned that. And now we're going to kind of shift into what kinds of quip, equipment have been used over the different generations. Um, we're kind of if you have like a little bit of what you know, what you kind of started with back in 1908 and then where your equipment is today, if we could kind of scope that a little bit. But since the operation flowed from one generation to the next, there was never an equipment sale held on the farm. In the barn, we still have the harnesses from when workhorses were used. We have and could occasionally use a two bottom pull type John Deere plow that had been pulled behind the first tractor. That was the steel wheeled John Deere A. We also have the two row planter and spools of wire that were used to check plant corn. The purpose of that is so that it could be cultivated in various directions. At that time, that was the only weed control available. And my father's first tractor that he purchased was a Alice Chambers WD along with the implements that fit it. This brought uh, hydraulic lift and rubber tires into the operation to make it a little easier to go down the road. The steel wheels didn't work too well to go very far. Uh, that WD is still being used with the loader on the farm. And I think I'll shift it and let Corbin explain what equipment we're using now. 
And so it's now we don't have our equipment isn't the newest and latest and greatest, but I guess we put a lot of work into taking a little bit older equipment and rebuilding it and kind of retrofitting it with some of the uh, latest and greatest technology to keep the equipment cost down, but still have the access to all that, the technology that the new stuff has. So yeah, our, both of our planners, we have a corn planner and a soybean planner for because we to capitalize on being able to plant soybeans early and get some of the yield gain that comes from that. So that's why we went to two different planners and which adds some cost, but we think we make that up and yield gain. And so both of those planners, we completely rebuilt those. So it's basically a brand new row unit on a older bar, but we added the uh, precision planting, precision planting 2020 monitor to both of the planners. So that's that monitor monitor really gives us a good insight into how the planner is working and that will show us population and singulation, seed spacing, down pressure, a good ride, just everything. Every it's got a base a metric on basically everything the planner is doing. So you can see if something's off and you can get that fixed right away. So you don't build a whole season with a big issue. You can address it right away and uh, helps you helps us do a better job planting, having all that information right at our fingertips. Uh, I guess also with the planners, we've put a bigger emphasis on a fertilizer placement with the planner to gain some of that efficiency. So we have, we're running both infro fertilizer and uh, two by two by two using 360 bandits. So it, it slows down planting a little bit to have to fill all those tanks, but uh, we feel it more than makes up for itself in the uh, efficient use of the nutrients. So that, that's been a pretty big upgrade for us in the last few years. And also going to combines with yield monitors, it, it's really valuable when you have that all that planner data that's getting mapped and bring a yield monitor into it too. So we have those yield maps and we can start bringing it, start tying things together. Like this hybrid is planted there. How did that yield? Or you saw we had a little bit of a planner issue there. We can look at the yield map there and see how much that really hurt us or stuff like that. It's, so I guess that's more where our equipment is gone. It's not so much buying brand new paint. It's taking what we already have and making it better. I like that. I like the retrofitting. I like making it work, um, making what you have fit for what you want to do and kind of incorporating those unique new technologies that are, when you think about the history of farming and where it's come, like nobody would have predicted those things. I think that's really awesome. Yeah, I think it's really yeah. exciting to hear how we started with the horse driven agriculture and then to now where you are using mo modern technologies with tractors and combines. Yeah, I think it's really exciting. Yes. And the bean planter is also intended to be our cover crop planter, and it should allow us to plant two different cover crops every 15 inches mm -hmm. to get some diversity in that, and maybe make it work a little bit better, get rid of some of the kinks that we've experienced in the past with cover crops. Awesome. Yeah, I great. like that. Yeah. Uh, so on that note, like uh, we have been talking about the different practices that you have been following since uh, you started the farm. And here again, like if there are, if you want to highlight some of the different practices that you do currently that are different from the past or present. Uh, the largest by far is moving from a moldboard plow and total tillage and cultivating to no-till. And right along this is we're studying what is a healthy soil and discovering new things all the time. Uh, plowing seemed like it was kind of a dead, dead end circle. You plowed, you created clods, then you dissed and dissed until you got the clods broke up. It just seemed like that was the wrong direction. 
waiting for rain to be able to cultivate. Then once rain, then you cultivated it and you dry the ground back out. Plus you cut off the roots where the fertility and the ground was at. That's my biggest change. Yeah, and I guess then kind of building off the no-tills, kind of next up with that is cover crops. Or, uh, the no-till is working well for us and then adding cover crops really, really helped cut down on the erosion because we have pretty hilly ground. So with, before no-till, there's really bad erosion, cutting gullies down the hills. No-till helped a lot with that, but there'd still be some every once in a while when you get a big rain. But then when you start adding cover crops and getting those rye roots out there, that really cut down the erosion even more that we don't even have gullies anymore when neighbors that do even no-till, they still get some gullies when you get a big rain. So that's really helped us out. And then uh, also banding fertility is something that we're starting to get into and still, and I think we're going to continue to evolve on that, that for a long time, for, fertilizer just broadcast on the surface and then with tillage I got worked in the ground so it was something like phosphorus that doesn't really move in the soil when you do tillage that gets down into the root zone where no till you kind of struggle with that so we're looking at ways of getting fertilizer banded in the soil um, while still trying to maintain as much of that no-till as we can uh, so I guess the planter has been a big part of that with the two by two by two we're putting some 10340 in there along with the nitrogen and sulfur to try and get that close to the red zone along with the infro as well and then kind of starting to look into if there's a way we can deep band fertilizer without doing a, a huge amount of tillage kind of something less tillage than like strip till to so it doesn't wash out in our hills but a way to get it deeper is what we're trying to figure out for this are going to be our next step i think okay village we do now is what we consider is a soil mover we've moved the ground that had washed out and flooded in and moved it back into the ditches so and we've been able to hold them like corbin said with the cover crops and we're finding that those same ditches that usually didn't produce anything are some of the most productive ground on the farm. Another thing that Yield Monitor tells us. That's really neat. I like how you're kind of bringing full circle with some of the new things you're learning. And you mentioned new discovery. And I think that's really a really key component to farming is that I feel like every day is a new discovery. Every year you're learning more and more, especially with new technology that comes out, what works, what doesn't work, um, and how that relates to your specific farm. And so I'm going to kind of tie this back in to someone had mentioned to me that you guys have done some on-farm research network through the university before. So that's kind of where this question is coming from. Um, with that, I'm going to say, do you work with the university on farm research network? If so, please share with us what you have been incorporating on your operation. We do, although this year we're stepping back because we've kind of run out of really good ideas to try. The randomization takes up a lot of space and limits how many things we can try. As you're, we're using a different footprint and are trying many more different ideas to narrow things down and then bring the top ones in and go back to the on farm. I kind of learned the hard way we need to do more diligence, due diligence when selecting products. We're also looking at better ways to more efficiently use the products that we already know work. Corbin's really the key of all the things we're trying. I'll let him yeah. enlighten you on that. Yeah, I think last, five years we've been involved with on-farm research. So we've tested quite a few things over that time. I think the way we really got into it is through the Innovative Youth Corn Challenge and 4-H. Kara and I were a team back when we were both 4-H members in Colfax County. And 
So we started that out as, as a trying out different in furrow fertilizer products. Uh, the there's kind of the standard the co-op had at that time was a they call it triple nickel. It's like a 820 55.5 fertilizer analysis that run in furrow. Then uh, someone else locally was selling a different lower salt product that's supposed to be more seed safe. That so we figured we'd give that a try, and we ended up the co-op product, the triple nickel. It actually ended up yielding better, and it by being a cheaper product, we had a lot better return on investment on that. So I guess that kind of goes back to the what Dad is saying that. We need it. Don't really trust what the companies tell you. You got to get out there and try it out on your own ground. Uh, and then next year, we did a soybean planting population study. So normally, we were doing 140,000 seeds per acre. So what we ended up doing that year was maybe we did our standard population of 140,000, dropped it 30,000 to 100. And ten thousand, and then raised it thirty thousand to one hundred seventy thousand. So he gave us a pretty good range. And across those three populations, we ended up with essentially the same yield, just plus or minus a bushel. So the uh, lower population had the best return on investment. So that told us we could feel comfortable dropping our soybean populations and maintain the same yield while also saving us some money. And so after that, the next two years were, we were really looking into uh, nitrogen rates using the pre side dress nitrate test to give us a little bit of an indication on what we need to do for our side dressing rate. So as both those years, we did what our normal practice was of about 180 pounds of nitrogen. And both of those years, the Pre side dress nitrate test told us we should be doing more like 150. So we did that. And then we also dropped in another 30 pounds just to see what would happen. And then I guess the second year we also added the a product called Pivot Bio Proven to see if we could, by lowering that nitrogen rate to like that 120, we could make up some of that or if we lower our nitrogen rate, rate to like 120 pounds and still get the same yield as 150 or 180 pounds of nitrogen, that would save us quite a bit of money and less fertilizer we have to haul around and all that. But it ended up being that we didn't see a response out of that product either. So so I guess that I guess even though and I guess last year we also did a soybean banded fertility project but we were in an extreme drought last summer so that it didn't really work out for us but as overall the on-farm research has showed us that a lot of what we were doing was right but it just nice to kind of confirm that so if i guess it would if it would have showed that we were doing something wrong that and that there's something better um or that's by not seeing that we did, we're doing something wrong. It kind of shows we're or we were doing things right and that we weren't leaving money on the table, I guess. Okay. Yeah, that's a really good perspective. I also love that you mentioned that you started doing this stuff when the younger generation, you and your sisters started doing this stuff when you were young yourselves. I I think it's so funny because I also did the innovative corn youth challenge so that's so funny to me I love that I like how that you incorporated that into your own family farm and for the past five years you've been trying to figure out what works what doesn't work um what can we believe and really what profits for us I like that perspective yeah I think you you really like highlighted what has worked working with down farm research and what has not what has helped you and what has not yeah I think that's that's a really good story we have here and then on that regard so what have been uh, some of the biggest challenges you have faced in farming? 
So for me, being a dry land farm, the lack of rain or the timing of the rain is probably the biggest challenge. It can be frustrating to put all the work into a crop and then it doesn't rain and you don't benefit from that work as much as you'd hoped. I'm hoping that with no-till cover crops and residue management, we can get better at banking the moisture that we do get. Yeah, and I guess for me being a younger beginning farmer, uh, biggest challenge I've experienced so far, which hasn't been a long time, but uh, we've kind of been in a time of uh, high input costs and expensive land, which it takes a lot of capital to get started farming. So that's another way that the on off farm job that I have, it kind of helps feed into farming, helps me get established a little more. And we've also had high commodity prices last few years that kind of, it kind of balances out that the high input cost, but it's still a big capital investment up front that you don't, doesn't get paid off for maybe a year after you make that investment. So it's just having the capital to really get started has been the biggest challenge for me so far. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to shift it also into, I want to ask each and every one of you, Tammy, as well as Kara, what has been your favorite memory of farming so far, especially as a family? I can go first, I guess. One of the first things um, is raising the bucket cows. That's one of my earlier memories, along with being a chicken. I've always been the animal person in the family, so um, I've always enjoyed helping them take care of the cattle and um, just all the critters we've had on the farm. Um, the bucket cows were, I treated them like my children, and <laughs> they uh, they were loved and babied, and <laughs> Uh, they were probably spoiled a little bit, but that's all right. <laughs> oh, I have so many memories of them with their 4 H projects and FFA projects. You know, hard to pick one. I just enjoyed all of them. I learned so much through their 4 H and FFA um, projects that they had helping them. Um, just I guess helping on the farm is one of the favorite things I have. Yeah, and I guess, yeah, I don't really have a specific favorite memory either, but I guess kind of the first thing I can remember as a kid is just following dad around and helping him, or I guess when you're a little kid, helping isn't so much a, what it is, it just kind of following around, but I guess trying, or in, in your mind, you think you're helping. Uh, but I guess and then as I grew up, I did start helping more. And so I guess that is kind of always being with dad and I guess the whole family. And I guess now that when Karen and I are older, we help with, or we're both very involved in planting and harvest. Just uh, I guess harvest time, it's always a lot of fun for me. It's generally, I'm running the combine when I'm around and then Kara's usually running the grain cart and dad's trucking and mom's running the auger at the bin and just kind of every or, or kind of all doing it together and it's just a lot of fun when we can be up clear when we're all doing something together. For me it's fun working together. There's something came to mind when we we're on the bucket calves. As they got into FFA, they moved up the ladder a little bit and bought some feeder calves. One year I was fortunate enough that one person brought the same number of heifers and steers to the market. They weighed the same and I bought the heifers and the steers. So we had a research project of which is more profitable having heifers or steers. And um, I think in some ways Carol won that year. I did win. <laughs> Not in just the one way, I won that year. I can, I can give myself that one victory. <laughs> The only challenge with having heifers is the neighbors have a bull and they seem to attract him to come over and visit. <laughs> and it's really a lot of fun with them. Um, we both have the same degree, but how much things have changed between the times we graduated and getting updated on 
the new developments in agriculture and crop production that Corbin's brought to the table. Probably ask him more questions sometimes and he asks me and it's supposed to be the other way around. I love that, that you have this this kind of older, really well-rounded, wise generation with the new generation that were, is on the cusp of these discoveries. What have they been learning? How is How has that college education changed over the years? I think that's a really unique perspective that comes out with your family. What are the unique advantages or strengths that come from having multiple generations working together on the farm? And you have kind of highlighted this a little bit. Yes. Um... It's definitely beneficial. And I'm probably a little different than what my father had been. He was real hesitant to make much of changes of the things that I had learned from school. And I like to think I'm much more open to the things that Corbin brought to the table. And really a lot of the things are our ideas, not his ideas do a lot of discussion awesome yeah yeah we spend a lot of time when we're gonna make a bigger change or i learned about something at school we always had a deep discussion about it kind of what are the positives and negatives of that what are the outcomes of that and yeah that was really beneficial yeah so i guess and for me Having somebody that's had a lot more experience farming, it's someone when when I'm getting started and it, well, it gives me someone to ask questions to or get advice from. And then uh, some of these ideas that I got from school, yeah, they sound really nice and in theory, but then to put it in practice, it doesn't quite work so well. And so having dad's experience to for him to kind of think through some of that stuff that I want to think of it was very beneficial to have that. Awesome. You can what see I bring to the table is more on the financial side after working as an ag lender for all those decades. One of the things I the perfectionist, the one that follows everything to the T is not the one that ends up ahead financially the farthest. It's that next tier that isn't striving for protect, perfection, but just willing to accept a few weaknesses. They don't spend as much money and they're the ones that actually end up ahead. So I challenge each of his ideas and kind of scale back some of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's really insightful. And uh, I, I believe that like it must be very challenging as well as exciting to have run the multi-generation farms and on that note, uh, can you please share with us, how do you ensure a smooth transfer of knowledge and skills from one generation to the next? Do you have uh, any kind of formal or informal mentoring, mentoring process in place? I don't know if we really do. <laughs> I guess kind of, I have a, some of the ground is under my control. So I make all the decisions on those acres, but uh, I kind of have dad to be watching over me when I'm doing that. And he, we kind of talk through that stuff, stuff or talk through that stuff. So I guess in a way there's that kind of mentoring that happens that way, but kind of as I'm trying new things and learning, I've got dad to go to, to kind of talk through it and ask questions. Kind of go ahead. Initially, I started off offering him to be a percentage of the operation, figuring that's going to make it really easy to figure out the uh, expenses and divide them up. And he paused and wasn't real anxious to jump at that. Instead, he preferred to have some of the ground be actually his ground that he's renting from me. And I think it's well worth it. That way, if we don't completely agree on something, then it's your decision. Yeah. And maybe I'll learn a lesson or two along the way. Yes. Yes. I think that's I think that's unique on how you how you kind of you know, you come together and you become that multi-generation where you have both the generations 
really working on the farm and w- hoping for it to progress forward and kind of how you divvied that up and how you go hand in hand with each other. I think that's really unique. And I think I think that's really common with a lot of the farming families that I've interacted with of how they do those things and how we actually transition from one generation to the next. So I think that's really unique. Um, we are going to go through another question. If you have to recall a few things in farming that have changed drastically over the years since you started, what would those be? Do you have any that come to mind? Well, the drastic one is going from plowing or complete tillage to Mm no-till and how we've had to learn to manage the chemical weed control much better. And now we're working on also bringing in cover crops as a way of managing weeds. Yeah, and I guess for me, I haven't had nearly as long of a career, but I was kind of start. I started farming on my own, kind of right as we were in COVID and coming out of COVID. So I guess something that probably really came out of that is consumers really wanted to know where their food come came from. That uh, kind of when they weren't able to go anywhere and they were kind of at home and cooking for themselves, it made them really start to question how their food is grown and where it comes from. So I think the farm to table movement and some of that stuff is gonna start to change agriculture where there's gonna be more, as stuff goes from the field to the processor, to the, to like your Walmart or Hy-Vee or whatever, and to the consumer, there's, uh, consumers are gonna wanna have more ability to trace that food they're buying back to the field that it came from. So that's something I see that uh, supply chain and the tracking of that stuff, I think is going to become a, it's started to become bigger and I think it'll become even bigger yet. Yeah, I I would agree with that. I think the farm to table movement is something that's really going to kind of alter the way we see agriculture and kind of how those things are done. And I think that's a really unique perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I I really like uh, the ideas that you have brought and and then uh, moving forward. So, uh, are there any digital agricultural trends or emerging technologies which can be a- any digital platforms or software that you are excited about or currently exploring on your farm? If so, like, uh, can you share with our audience, how do you feel these newer technologies aid in the development of your family's operations? Well, for my part, the biggest and would be a huge undertaking is going to subsurface irrigation. None of our ground fits for center pivot, and I'm not so fond of all the evaporation that takes on. This would be a way that we could be much more efficient in the use of water and also allowed us to spoon feed the fertility along the way. It it would be financially a very big move for us, but we're fortunate that so much of the ground is contiguous that one well could potentially irrigate an awful lot of acres. Yeah, and I guess the the technology that could kind of feed into that to some extent is Right now, we're currently grid sampling all of our ground for fertility or for fertility levels. But something that might kind of feed into that to some extent is we're looking into more of a management zone type of sampling where we have a zone of a similar soil type and water holding capacity and topography and kind of managing is each one of those zones is going to Hold water a little differently that when you got a center pivot going over the top of that it's you can't really adjust how much water is going on based on that zone so a subsurface drip you could maybe kind of fine-tune that a little bit and kind of and this section of the drip is this zone that doesn't hold on or what doesn't hold on water quite as well so maybe put a little more water there and a little bit less water in a zone that holds water a little better is in a bottom that receives some runoff water. And so kind of, and even for variable rate fertility and variable rate seeding, that 
kind of all those management zones kind of bring all that together because if you have a zone that you're shooting for 150 bushel corn that doesn't just have doesn't have the water holding capacity and just isn't capable of producing high yields you're going to manage that a whole lot differently fertility wise seeding right wise water wise compared to a zone that's capable of uh, 270 bushel corn so yes I see that becoming something bigger that we're starting to look into okay. it's something that I think we've kind of agreed to disagree He's following zones on the ground that he's operating, and I'm stuck on the grids. I'm wondering if we shouldn't have smaller grids instead of just two and a half acres right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's no, that's a really excellent point, especially um, I think I have this conversation with a lot of dryland farmers, is how can those um, types of water irrigation systems fit their farm because not everybody has the capability of really or even financially running those pivot systems so i think i think that's an excellent point i think there are a lot of technologies coming to market on how to work with those things and how can we better um fit them to the soil plans so i love that yeah i think i think it's really interesting to hear like and then agreeing and disagreeing on different ideas and building up what best can work for our farms. I think that's that's really great to hear about from your farm. Yes. So my next question is, how do you envision the future of agriculture, especially from a digital perspective? What advancements or changes do you expect to see in the coming years? And what kind of makes you excited about them? I guess Corbin is going to do a better job of explaining this. The thing, I think we're going to have a tool in the future that we can tissue sample right in the field and have it tell us where that plant's at rather than collecting them and sending them in. Mm -hmm. I think that's still kind of on the early edge of coming. Yeah. I mean, last few years, we've been kind of getting into a more intensive tissue sampling program, kind of wanting to track all season long how how the crop is doing and when we're running a little short on this nutrient or when we have an excess of this nutrient. So, and trying to see how that would fit into our total fertility program. We have being able to take those samples right in the field, kind of see what we're short on and maybe making a fuller application of some nutrient if we're really deficient. I think that would be something big that would help us kind of collect some of that data to uh, verify our soil sampling as well. And then just kind of feeding off that in general, the it kind of leads to the ability to, to manage. It used to be you managed a whole field and then now we're kind of breaking it down into those zones or grids that we're managing. And it kind of starts leading down the road of managing even smaller yet, like. I'm sure at some point we'll almost be able to manage every plant separately from the one around it. So I guess it's kind of working on that continuation. We're a long ways from that yet, but um, I'm sure it's coming at some point. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think I think there's a giant focus right now on how digital ag really manages plants and how do we look at them, how what we're looking at, how do we determine that's useful, and then more importantly, how do we make that applicable to family farms like yours? How can how can we develop that for these areas and how can we use it in real life field settings? I think that's really important. And I love that you mentioned that because I get excited about that, too. That's probably one of my favorite parts of digital ag. Yeah, I agree. And then uh, I think the one important aspect of uh, adopting a new digital technology out available out in the market is cost and what profitability it brings to your farm. So I think that's that's what really plays into the adoption of the technologies. So with that, uh, we are almost coming to the end of uh, today's episode. Is there anything uh, we didn't talk about today and that you might want to add or mention, share to our listeners? The thing maybe going back to clarifying with us, i talking about the perfectionist and the financial. Really, it's about new technologies that keep coming out that 
obsolete other technologies. If you're trying to stay cutting edge all the time, you're not holding on to the other technology long enough for it to pay for itself, so to speak. Sometimes being just a little bit behind, it was the greatest thing in the world two years ago. It couldn't have gone that bad that fast. Yeah, I guess that's something we've kind of adopted. We're not, for the most part, we're not the most cutting edge on technology. We're kind of, what was the, what was cutting edge yesterday, we kind of have today in a way. So yeah, we kind of have a way of vetting the technology and we don't adopt it right away. We kind of watch and make sure it performs the way it, or, or performs the way we would expect. And then when it, when we feel that it would be a, a benefit to us, then we kind of adopt that at that point when we, no, it will have a return on investment for us. No, I love that you brought that up. I think that's really relatable. I think not everybody has the capability of being cutting edge. And so I think that perspective is just really relatable and that a lot of people, especially our listeners on the podcast, could understand exactly where you're coming from. And I would 100% agree just because it was hot on the market two years ago doesn't mean it doesn't completely work today. You have to give some things some time and it takes time to adopt them to you and to make them fit for what you need. So I really like that you mentioned that. Yes. So our last question of the interview today is it's a tradition on the Farm Bits podcast to ask, to ask each guest for a piece of advice. So what advice would you give to other multi-generational farming families who are looking to maintain and grow their family farm for future generations? Well, listen, my parents grew up during the Great Depression and they obviously did something right that we're here talking about the family farm today. The Depression is something we talked about quite a bit and I was interested in. And also talked with my aunt and uncle who were 10 years older. So we really got into the depth of the depression. I also did my own fair amount of studying about it. And starting out and farming myself in the 1980s was another challenging time in agriculture. My takeaway from this is live within your means. Have the record keeping in place to know how much you're spending on your living expenses, not just guess. And then if you've got that, you know, you take good records, not just your tax record, but good records on the profitability of your operation. And you may just not have to, have to do without things. You need to be careful not to borrow to live a lifestyle above what you can afford. You need to set your own financial priorities. What is important to you? not what's important to someone else, uh, spending money just to impress somebody else that with something you get very little satisfaction on really is a waste of your resources. You need to think your purchases through very carefully. Uh, keep your overall debt low. Knowing your income earning potential and making decisions based on that. If you have a strong property statement, your lender is not going to be the one in charge of your operation. You will be because they're going to know that you can go to any other lender and they'll welcome you in with, and be happy to have you. I think my largest mistake was not having enough confidence in myself to do what I knew was the right thing to do. Listening to others is fine and a good way to learn many things, but it's up to you to make the end decision based on what you think is right. Uh, I guess a piece of advice that I would give to as multi general multi generational farming families is being open to trying new things on the farm. Kind of like what we've been talking about this whole time is like trying stuff out. And but you also need to know that previous generations they were, they had to be doing a lot of things right on the farm. So you don't want to completely go away from that too quickly because they 
they had to be successful in what they were doing. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a family farm today. So you kind of need to be open to trying things out, kind of making changes, but not change what the main things that made your farm what it is today. There's, there's certain things that just don't change with time. The, the, you have to remember to keep those things in place and not move past that. Absolutely. I love that. I I really enjoy that. Tammy or Kara, do you have anything you'd like to add to that statement? Yeah, I can go. Um, I think it was something I kind of learned through FFA and 4-H that you don't have to be directly involved in the farm to still have an impact on agriculture and farming in general. Um, obviously, I took a different career path with nursing um, but I still find myself very involved on the farm in many different ways. And as a nurse, now I'm working in rural Nebraska and I'm able to serve the community that I grew up in. Um, I'm able to help um, people involved in agriculture um, take the best care of themselves so that they can go on and take care of their farms and their animals and their crops and everything. So it's it's not necessarily that I'm directly in agriculture, but I help support it in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. I think the work ethic that the kids develop growing up on the farm is very important. It's very important to work as a family. Um, you make so many memories doing things like that and, and raising a family on the farm is just the best place to be. I love all of those statements. I could not agree more. I think you guys do a great job at representing what a family farm is and some of those really awesome values, what your what the kids come out with it. And then also serving community, a community of people who are working in agriculture, especially in rural Nebraska, which is where I'm from. So I think that's really awesome. And I really enjoyed that perspective. Thank you very much to Kudera family for taking the time to join this episode of the Palm Beach podcast. It's really exciting to hear insights from different generations about the multi-generation farm and how farming has evolved over years. One of my favorite parts of this episode is getting to know that operating a multi-generation farm is very exciting and at the same time very challenging. I couldn't agree more. In this episode, you really see the strengths of each generation and how they rely on each other to continue as a successful operation. I hope you enjoyed this episode and we look forward to sharing another digital ag story with you next week on FarmBits. Thank you for taking the time to join us today on the FarmBits podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to be informed about the latest content each week. We welcome your feedback. So if you have any comments or questions for us, please reach out to us over email, on Twitter, or in the review section of your favorite podcast platform. Our contact information can be found in the show notes. We would like to thank Nebraska Extension for their support of this podcast and their commitment to providing high quality informational material to members of the agricultural community in Nebraska and beyond. The opinions expressed by the host and guest on this podcast are solely their own and do not reflect the views of Nebraska Extension or the University of Nebraska Lincoln. We look forward to you joining us next week for another episode of Farm Beats.